want to welcome you to Austin Heights Baptist Church this fourth Sunday of Easter, and it says outdoor worship service. As you can see, uh, we are doing Plan B, indoor outdoor worship service. Beautiful outside, but still wet and uh, ground, and so we had electrical cables and all that, and we decided yesterday to make sure we came in, and it's a little chilly out there anyway. So let's join together in the greeting. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Now I invite you to stand. Go to one another with these words of encouragement. And if you do mind me saying, you need the encouragement, it looks like. As you make your way back to your seats, I'm going to ask that uh, those of you who are seated on the outside, the seat pockets in front of you has a little black notebook. It's the way we keep up to date with one another, uh, current information, contact information. If you'll take that and complete that, pass it along for others on your row. And while you're doing that, let me call your attention very quickly to some announcements. The main one, the most immediate one, as you note, following this morning service, uh, roughly around 12.15, we will have potluck. Uh, many of you have brought lots of food, and we're grateful and looking forward to it. I want you to invite you to stay, join us for uh, potluck lunch. It's a fun time, good time for, to actually get to know one another. And if you need more uh, information about that, uh, you can see Dixie, raise your hand back there. And she'll give us instructions at the end of the service. Uh, Christina, youth uh, announcement. So we're going to have youth from uh, 3 to 6 today. We're going to Applebee CSA, so please make sure you're here at 3 o'clock. And I've dressed as an example for what you should wear, okay? <laughs> so please come in layers and with, like, appropriate shoes on because it's muddy out there. So we'll see you guys at 3. Okay. Come on. Uh, Judy, you have announcements? Um, next Sunday is Children's Sabbath. We will be having a rehearsal for that on Saturday. It did not get in the bulletin, but on Saturday we will have a rehearsal. I'd like to have everybody who has a part here at 10 o'clock. We hope we can be finished in an hour. Um, so just make sure everybody's here. And some of you have some things you need to work on this week before you come on Saturday. The preachers will meet with me on Tuesday after school, and they're going to get back with me about what's the appropriate time, and then they will also work with me on Saturday, probably after the general rehearsal. Um, if you look ahead at the other announcements, choir practice, choir practice today, then you see um, looking further out on uh, April 28th is also going to be quarterly business meeting 
uh, we'll keep you informed about that. Are there other announcements we need uh, to know about? Yeah, I, I want to say thanks again uh, for all the donations to the Austin Heights garage sale, which are now part of the Playhouse garage sale. We, we attempted it yesterday. We didn't do very well. The weather was threatening and uh, people didn't come out, but we, even so, we still made a I love all of y'all who are uh, take one load of stuff to a garage sale and then come home with a different load of stuff. Yeah. That's always, I sort of grew up like that myself. Um, one other thing, this past week, this past week, Jane and I went to Austin for a memorial service and celebration for former pastor Roger Painter, long time uh, friend of mine, and he was pastor here from 78 to 82. Uh, I was a part of the service, and as a gift, uh, their, his daughter, Mary Catherine Painter, gave me this stole that belonged to Roger, an Easter stole that he wore for many years, and I just wanted the Austin Heights congregation to know that I'm wearing Roger Painter's stole this morning. All right, this is, okay. Can I just have a quick announcement? Yes. I brought a bunch of um, freezer bags and put them out there. So freezer bags in the kitchen after potluck, uh, we can have food that we can also pass along to Jody Franks. And we'll talk about Jody during the prayer time, but that's good. Bruce? So the first person at SFA that called me when I came there in 1977 was Dr. Nancy Stepney. And that's a friend of mine for 40 years, on and off. We professionally worked together. And she passed away this week. Right. Well, we will remember her family and family during the prayer time a little bit later. So thanks for saying that. All right. Um, I was trying to think if there was something else. Oh, Jane and I will be traveling to uh, a second Roger Painter service this week in Jackson, Mississippi. It will be a more formal uh, worship service in Northminster Baptist Church in uh, Jackson. Okay, as we've done the last several weeks, let's prepare for worship by uh, having a breath prayer. In the Jewish and Christian uh, tradition, mystical tradition and other religious traditions as well. So let's begin by breathing out, breathing in, and then breathing out gently and quietly. Be still and know that I am God. And now I ask that you breathe, be still, and know. And then be still. And finally, be. Let us worship God.
Please join me in the call to worship. We come to worship the God who creates this earth and calls it good. Holy, 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 this place is filled with God's presence. We come to follow Jesus Christ who redeems this and makes new this earth. Holy, 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 this place is filled with God's presence. We come to be empowered by the Holy Spirit who spreads throughout this earth. Holy, 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 this place is filled with God's presence. Loving God, thank you for another day for us to gather. Please lead us today as we worship together, learn about your creation, and learn how to care for it both physically and spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. I invite the children to come. Join Aunt Judy at the front. Sabbath just kind of fit right in 
culture, doesn't it? Can, what have we been talking about? People can tell me we've been talking about this for several weeks now. The fruits of the spirit. That's right. So let's talk about fruits of the trees. What do fruits of the trees need to grow? What do they need? Winter? They need water. Fresh air. They need fresh air. Soil. They need water. Rich soil, that's right, and sunlight. And sometimes we've got to feed them, don't we? Give, give them some fertilizer or something to make them grow. Worms. Now, worms, yes. <laughs> now, trees pretty much stay in one place, don't they? And the water and the sunshine and the food comes to them. Sometimes it comes from the sky, and sometimes it comes from a gardener who makes sure it gets watered and fed. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, children. Now, our, our ushers are coming forward at this time, as they usually do with prayer cards. We invite you to look on the back page at our prayer list as you're looking over the list. If you see someone that needs a prayer card from you or others may come to mind, raise your hand. You can have as many cards as you like. Write a note to, these, uh, to anyone that you know needs a note of encouragement. Uh, and leave it in the offering plate later or in the church office after the service. Now, as you look over that, let me mention a couple of things. One, we've already mentioned.
not, and then we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer printed in the order of service. Loving God, hear our prayers this morning. Oh God, we pray on this Earth Sunday for all your earth. We pray for each other. We pray for friends and neighbors we don't even know by name across the sea in places of extraordinary conflict and violence and injustice and poverty. We pray for your peace, your shalom that brings harmony and right relationship with you, with each other, and with all the planet. We ask your spirit to move in our midst in this small church, in this small corner of your planet, bringing hope and healing, encouragement, and that in this small place, among this small group, you work in and through bringing healing in a wider way that we don't even understand yet. We pray for healing of brokenness and old hurts and pains and griefs. Call us to Christ this morning, O God, this and more through Christ Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin first in silence. Please join me in the corporate confession. O oh God, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, you place us in your beloved creation and you entrust us to care for it. Your works declare glory and splendor and you call us to praise and reverence where we have degraded or destroyed earth's bounty, forgive us. Where we have taken beauty and majesty for granted, grant us your grace. Where we have become estranged from the creatures with whom we share this planet, have mercy upon us, renew us, refresh us, and sustain us. Hear the assurance of pardon. Hear the gospel through Jesus Christ. We are forgiven and empowered to live in a new way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture lessons today are from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 26, and 51 through 58. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark, as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're, pretty, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. There is a nice symmetry in his death. Death initially uh, came by a man and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam. Everyone comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first. Then those with him at his coming, the grand consumption when, after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom uh, to God and the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down. The very last enemy is death. And now for 51 through 58. But let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet. And in the time that you look up and blink your eyes, it's over. On signal from the trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves, beyond the reach of death, never to die again. And at the same moment and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable, this mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true, death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word? Oh, death. Oh, death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening, and law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destruction power. But now, in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, and death, are gone, the gift of our master Jesus Christ. Thank God. With all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground, and don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Thank you, choir. Thank y'all's willingness to improvise this morning and come indoors. We, I know we wanted to be outside, and of course, looking out the window is gorgeous, but it's chilly and even more, it's wet. So thanks for your willingness to improvise. Let's pray. Well, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Earlier this week, when Jane and I were on our way to Austin for this memorial service for Roger Painter, we decided to take a quick detour to drive by my, the church that was my first pastorate out in the country not far from the town of Franklin on Highway 79. Much has changed, of course, as we drove out there. Pastures that used to have cattle grazing are now overgrown with brush and trees. Other pastures now have houses and small developments and so on. As we drove up to the little church at the top of the hill, we immediately noticed the sign no longer said Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, but now read Higher Dimensions Christian Center. What a name. <laughs> Higher Dimensions Christian Center. Now I'm not here to discuss the name change of my first congregation. I am interested in the assumption applied in the name higher dimensions, higher. Of course, over the years and even centuries, higher implies spiritual and closer to heaven or closer to God. It implies living on a higher, more heavenly level than down here among the muck and the mundane. For centuries, the spiritual has been considered higher and purer, while the material and earthy has been considered lower and more sinful. For example, one of the sources of racism is rooted in the 15th century Portuguese and Spanish explorers when they came upon darker skinned people of Africa and assumed they were a lower species, note the word lower, because the darker skin was closer to the color of the earth and soil, hence interpreted as less spiritual than the lighter skinned people of Europe. In the early 16th, I mean the late 16th and early 17th century in England, under James I, King James, nature and the earth were considered like women to be disorderly, wild, and lower. Both women and nature needed to be brought under the control of the orderly male mind. <laughs> hey, I don't need any booing from the congregation. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've ever been booed from the congregation before. I'm not saying this is my view. I'm telling you this is what I'm, okay? <laughs> the mind was supposed to be more spiritual and pure and rational while the body and the earth were considered irrational, out of control in a lower form of life. Francis Bacon, considered the founder of the modern scientific revolution, used the same language to describe science and what science needed to do to study the earth and all of the uh, different uh, branches of science and used the same language that was used in the torture of heretics, witches, and rebels. Bacon said, and this is a quote, just as men should not scruple to assault and torture the bodies of women accused of witchcraft or sorcery, neither ought man to make a scruple of entering and penetrating into these holes and corners when inquisition of truth is his whole object. Now previously, before Bacon, before King James era, medieval times in Europe, nature had long been considered as feminine. Christian mystics considered the feminine earth and the mother and mother nature as partners with God. You, know, you hear me on this, as partners with God, not on a lower level, but partners. During medieval times, it was considered to be 
We were to be respectful of Mother Nature and the feminine Earth. By the time of Bacon, nature and Earth needed dominating, and the spread of civilizing empire required exploiting nature and dominating it. For example, in, in medieval England, in medieval England, coal mining was considered a sin. But by the time of James I and Francis Bacon, coal mining was considered a good thing. Now, all this old thinking has long been in the back of our American Christianity ways of thinking and in the back of the ways many of us were raised. As an aside, one of the results, especially in American uh, evangelical Christianity, is that when so much emphasis is put on higher abstract spiritual understanding of Christianity, it leaves the lower, the material, up to other ways of belief and practices. So we put all the emphasis on being Christian, which is about being spiritual and being saved and, and, and getting to heaven and all of that. But down here, where you're dealing with day-to-day -day stuff with other people in this world, we leave that up to other models of behavior. So you can believe fervently in Jesus and trust Jesus to get you saved, but that has nothing to do, there's no connection with material beliefs of guns and violence, racism, exploiting the earth and dominating others, and on and on. In much of American Christianity, evangelical Christianity, there's long been a disconnect between the higher spiritual and the lower material. Now the Bible has a different way of thinking about these things. C.S. Lewis famously said, God too loves material things. God invented them. It's why the preferred terminology in Christianity is creation, which historically emphasizes that we're all creatures. We're in all this together. Humanity, trees, water, soil, plants, animals, the climate, and on and on. Now, there's an old hymn that goes, has a line that says, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Well, the testimony of the Bible is heaven came down and glory filled this earth and all that's in it. Our biblical faith moves from heaven to the earth, not the other way around. I guess if we use this logic, uh, my old congregation ought to be named uh, lower dimensions. So, <laughs> the biblical direction is God coming down, if we want to use up and down language, to us rather than us trying to get higher to heaven. Which is why the Apostle Paul says in our scripture reading today that the resurrection of Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection of everything. Easter morning is the beginning of the new creation breaking into this old world. This is why for Christians, Sunday morning is treated ever since the gospel resurrection stories as the first day of the week. Sunday is the first day of the new creation. It's called, historically, as the eighth day, the first day of new creation. It's why so many churches were octagonal in, in shape, eight-sided, and why baptistries were eight-sided. The original creation was completed in seven days, but now in Christ, we have a new creation, the eighth day. And the resurrection is not just new creation intervening into this old, it's also the template or the prototype of the new creation. Resurrected Christ shows us what the new creation is supposed to look like and someday will. Now when Jesus was resurrected, he did not leave his old body behind in the tomb and grow a new one. And there are reasons, now, some of you will say, no, Kyle, I don't believe this. That's okay. I mean, this is a place where we ask questions and talk about this stuff, but I, my case this morning in this sermon is why this bodily resurrection that Paul is talking about is such a big deal. Paul's saying he didn't leave the old body behind and become a spiritual being of some sort, a ghost. The stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are insistent to the point of becoming redundant that the resurrected body of Christ is flesh and blood. You can see, I mean, it all every story, you can still see, touch the scars left by the nails and the spear. This was the body that was dead. 
totally dead. And totally dead for three days, but was resurrected as a new body. Jesus is the same, but it was di is different. His resurrected body ate and drank. And they, they, story after story in the Gospels, the resurrected Christ eating and drinking, and they see him and they touch him. This is a big deal. But he was different. He could walk through locked doors and barred doors. Now, the early church understanding that the resurrection resurrected body of Christ was not less real but more real in fact first century Christians and Jews believed that the spiritual was not ghostly as much as more dense kind of material the resurrected Christ is more real not less real he was the beginning of the new creation now, all of these gospel resurrection stories in the Gospels are united in this. And then we, and, and, and we disciples enter, of Jesus enter into, participate in the new creation in our baptism. When we follow Jesus, we're beginning to learn to live according to the new creation. So we no longer treat one another in the old dichotomies of Jew and Gentile black or white, straight or gay, but we are one people in Christ, new creation. We, are no long, we no longer deal with money like old creation, but in Christ we share and give and serve new creation. We no longer use violence to get our way, but in Christ we learn to turn the other cheek and go the second mile, give up our cloaks as well as our coats. That's called new creation. In the new creation we love and treat each other with mercy we forgive and receive forgiveness. We are patient and humble, all as a part of new creation. And when Mary Magdalene saw the resurrected Jesus that Easter morning and mistook him for the gardener in John 20, that's no accident. The church said Christ is the original gardener who created and cared for the first garden at creation. And it's in the Garden of Gethsemane that Christ suffered and was arrested for his crucifixion. The very first act of the resurrected Christ was to tend the Garden of New Creation just as he tended the Garden of the Old Creation. And finally, at the end of it all, in Revelation 21 and 22, right in the middle of New Jerusalem, there will be a garden watered by the river of life. And in the garden... Uh, there will be a, the tree of life from which the leaves are for the healing of the nations. In that new creation garden, Christ will be the garden. I mean, all this stuff fits together. Now, in the Gospels, especially John, Jesus gives us signs, sort of windows, to sort of look through and see what this new creation is up to. Jesus shows, shows us that God is working in through ordinary, everyday, mundane, earthy, earthy stuff. Not high spiritual abstraction, but earthy. Yeah. So, for example, at the wedding at Cana, John 2, water is transformed into wine. John 6, Jesus takes five barley loaves of bread, two fish, and feeds 5,000 with a feast. Immediately after the feast, Jesus walks across the firm footing of a stormy sea. Soon he takes mud from the ground, which becomes a healing ointment uh, for the eyes of a blind man in John 9. And after the resurrection, a previously barren and empty sea yields up 153 fish. Everyday stuff of this earth, everyday stuff of our lives becomes a window through which we are to catch a glimpse of what God's new creation looks like. The earthy becomes an icon. Now this is why a long tradition of the Eastern Church prays with icons. Pictures, for example, of people from the Bible or Christian history are used for worship in prayer. They are not praying to those pictures of the saints. Instead, these are icons, windows, that we learn through practice in the Eastern Church to pray through that allows us allows them to see glimpses of God's new creation, icons, windows. The resurrected Christ is the ultimate icon. 
the prototype of the new creation. Paul says he's the first fruits. This is the first thing. We're getting, we're getting the hors d'oeuvre here. I mean, this is it. He shows us what it's going to look like when creation's made new, not just people, but all of creation becomes new. Now, this is part of the significance of the transfiguration, where Jesus' face shines like the sun and his clothes become dazzlingly white garments. In and through the transfigured Christ, we receive a glimpse of God's intention for all of us and for all this earth. Furthermore, Christ calls us to join with him and start living out the new creation here and now. Now, all of this is going on in the background as the Apostle Paul tries in 1 Corinthians 15 to reflect on the resurrection of Christ and our bodily resurrection using language and imagery that nobody has ever used before because it's never happened before. Like Christ, we too will be resurrected like Christ, it will be bodily, new bodies, not old bodies, not, old, not ghosts. And like Christ, where we have scars, but they are transformed. And where we are more real, not less. Now let me make another aside. Roger Painter's memorial service this past week in Austin the entire congregation stood and sang the great hymn that we sing here quite often, We, O God, Unite Our Voices. It's also known as the Crescent Hill Hymn because it was written at Crescent Hill Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. And that room was full of people who had connections with Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and Crescent Hill Baptist Church and that great hymn. It meant a lot to Roger and his family means a lot to me and Jane and to you. We stood and sang this hymn. People were crying. I stood on the chancel and was looking out at old friends. Many of us were gathered that day, have known each other for 30, 40, and some even for 50 years. We've served together. We've worked alongside one another. We've been in churches together, been to camp together. I mean, I talked to people that I've been to camp, went to youth camp with, 25 years ago, I talked to deacons from First Baptist Church in Austin where I led a retreat like 20 years ago. All of the, these connections go deep and long, but at the same time, I looked out at brokenness and hurt, old wounds and old scars, strokes, heart attacks, surgeries that left us limping, old divorces and divisions, betrayals and infidelities that also left us hurt and limping. We sang that hymn in the hope that someday in the new creation we will be healed and made new, but we also know that those old scars persist, healed and somehow made whole, but they're still there. Now, I don't know how to explain it. Paul doesn't. Theologians across the centuries that I've read are wrestling with this, but the scars are there even though there's wholeness. Now hang in there with me in the next step. New creation is not only about resurrected and transformed people, it's about transformed and resurrected heavens and earth. All creation becomes new. All the cosmos will be resurrected. Rocks and trees, creeks and rivers, birds and fish, animals, the climate, our atmosphere and ecosphere, ecosphere, all. But if Christ is the prototype, it also means there will be scars and wounds still visible. There will, they will be healed and made new, but the scars on our earth will still be known. Now, what we're doing to God's creation will still be noticeable in the new creation. Climate change and mountaintop removal and oil spill disasters and melting ice caps and on and on. How all that will be known in the new creation, I don't know, but I do not doubt it will be seen as scars and wounds. What I think this means, and I'm not alone in this, is that the resurrection means that what we do in the present, what we do today, matters into God's future. And it means that this earthy stuff of all of our lives matters into God's future. 
New Testament scholar N.T. Wright put it this way, the resurrection, God's rec recreation of this wonderful world which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live in the risen Christ and the power of the Spirit means that what we do in Christ and by the Spirit in the present is not wasted. It will last and be enhanced in God's new world. So hear me. What we do in Christ and by the Spirit today in the present is not going to just be wiped away someday. It will last and be enhanced as part of new creation. Every action, every word, every song sung, every meal served, every effort at healing, bringing justice, making peace, loving our neighbors, showing mercy, and acting gracefully in and by the living Christ will be enhanced and become part of the new creation that God is making in this world. What we do matters over the long haul. It matters for eternity. So it, we need to make sure that what we're doing is Christ-like, earthy stuff and not something that will scar and wound and break. A part of growing as disciples of Jesus means learning to notice and pay attention to Christ and what's going on around us. The new creation's breaking in. Y'all know the famous line from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the poet, Earth's crowned with heaven, and every common bush is a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. So we got to learn to see that the earth is crowned with heaven. We don't have to live higher. We need to live lower where we can and learn to see. And we oppose the principalities and powers that are destruct, destroying, diminishing, dividing, and dominating this planet and each other. Yes. Creation, nature, ceases to be an icon. We see glimpses of God's glory, but what happens we see mountaintop removal, the ocean covered in plastic and poisons running off into our water. It makes a difference. We want to see God's, God's presence in this earth. Now, I said earlier that baptism is an immersion into and not out of this earthy world of the new creation. We're called to participate with God in living out the new creation. It renews, restores, heals, and transforms. This is no spectator religion. You've heard this from me for 30 years. It's wholly participatory because God in Christ participated in this world in our lives by coming and living among us, becoming one of us. We also know God and know God's healing work by participating, by getting involved. All right, I'm going to use Jim Lemon as a sermon illustration. That's right, not the first time, won't be the last. But this is, I've talked about this before, it's one of my favorite images and memory is Jim at TJR school teaching these kids how to garden. Now if I remember right, Jim, these were like first and second graders, maybe third graders, but we're talking smaller children. And you had plowed up that garden, and we were turning over the soil while the children were all around, and I mean they were loving it, ooing and aahing and fascinated by what's going on and asking, what's that? Why are you doing this? At one point, Jim turned over some soil full of earthworms and that gaggle of children exploded in joy and excitement. Of course, Jim had their sticking their hands in the soil and digging down with both hands and holding the soil and feeling it and smelling it and even tasting it. It's good topsoil. None of this spectator religion, none of this analytical, abstract, objective thinking off in the distance, and certainly no abstract spirituality up in heaven. The Christian faith is caring for creation, and it calls us, requires us to jump in with both hands. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one true God, Mother of us all, amen.
Loving Creator, accept our humble offerings and work through us to cherish and nurture your creation. That includes not just us humans, but the community of all living things. We are all threads in the fabric of your creation, from the smallest soil microbe to the condors that soar in the sky. Give us the wisdom and humility to understand this interdependence and respect and protect all parts of your creation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 I ask you to remain standing in, in your song sheet, the hymn, Earth and All Stars. In a moment we're going to sing this hymn, and I'll be at the front here to receive anyone who professes Christ saying that you want to be a part of Austin Heights Baptist Church, we'll receive you as we sing.
you know for years Louise and Ingo have been participating in this church wholehearted, wholehearted. I mean, they are volunteers. They do all kinds of stuff. But today, they're actually coming to join us and be official members. <laughs> so uh, I've asked if they would like to say anything, and they'd, and they'd like to take a moment. Um, Twelve years ago, it was earthy things. Tar Sands blockaders who inspired us to come here. We wanted to be part of a congregation who was working to try and do something better. And it's the earthy things that have kept us coming over and over and made Austin Heights really be a home before we realized it was our home. By them, of course, by them standing here, they are also making a statement of renewal and recommitment to Christ and Christ's people, the body of Christ, part of the first fruits. Um, they are making a statement to pray for you and encourage you, serve, and help, <coughs> be involved like they've done for 12 years. At the same time, if you say amen, amen. you are formalizing making a promise <coughs> before God that you will support them, pray for them, encourage them as we all learn how to be the church. Now, if you're willing to make that commitment, will you say amen? Amen! All right, that's pretty You got a big amen. I got booed today. So, <laughs> so uh, after the service, we're going to be setting up. Uh, Dixie, any instructions on what to do about setting up? Yes. Why don't we just uh, limit the tables to this side so we all only have half the chairs to put away. We'll set up in this, in the multi-purpose room, and we'll sit here, and we'll go ahead and set, you know, the serving line like we always do down the center. If you haven't brought anything, please stay. We've got so much food back there, and, and we love you, and this will be our fellowship together. Good. This is this is this stuff is it's a big deal. I mean, we're going to eat together in all eternity. We need to practice eating together now, all right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, enjoy. Uh, let's stand together for a benediction. After the benediction, in the, in the midst of all the chaos, you want to come over and greet Louise and Ingo uh, officially. Let's take each other's hands for our benediction. All right, look who you're holding hands with and hold on tight because we're going to need each other this week. Now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and give you grace. May the countenance of God be upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.